I think uh, we were debating, I'm, I'm going to be 15 years ago. Um, Ruth List and I were figuring out the toughest thing of doing any organization. It's, it's been the same tough thing since day one, um, getting guest speakers. And when Ruth and I originally came to Rittenhouse, we did not like the speakers. And uh, we secretly snuck away to Princeton. And uh, I was a member of the Princeton Club, and I really thought that they had a good club. And um, Ken Kremer happened to be the program director there. And I had even said to Ruth one time, man, this guy's dynamite. He really, like, he fires up a meeting and gets it all started. And I eventually went to Ken, and I admitted to him I was stealing speakers from him. I would uh, actually go up to them at yes. the end of the meeting and get them to come down to the Franklin with us. And uh, Ken even said, well, he does talks, too. And that resulted in, he probably was working with us for the better part of eight years. And when we did a monthly newsletter, it really kept the newsletter going. He put a big meaty piece in, and it was like a, a report of what was going on with NASA, rocket launches and whatever. So I recently bumped into Ken up at a NEEF conference about a year ago. And right. he, had told, he had told me that he was uh, relocating to live in Florida most of the time. And, uh, I guess today it came to my idea that Ken's living his dream because he's very close to the Cape where the launches take place at. And instead of having to drive thousands of miles down there to cover something like this, and I know many friends that do this and they say it's, it's an absolute thrill. He gets to experience that quite often. So he's right there on the site. So, uh, I'd like to introduce everybody to Dr. Ken Kremer. Um, he's a return guest speaker with us. And he's been multiple times with us at the Fellows Planetarium. And remember, he has a website that we're linking to. Um, he's part of something. He is uh, something called Space Up Close. So, Ken, do you want to take? Oh, wait, this is where we do this thing, too. So this is the part we're now going to be putting online. Uh, quick business okay. point. We just we decided that the part leading up to and everything that's all for members. So this right. will be the clapper officially. If you guys don't know this, this is the Milt Friedman clapper. And I'd like to say welcome to the uh, wait a second. Let me try this again. Uh, welcome to the November meeting, uh, the November. Welcome to the November event of the Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. Our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Ken Kremer. All right. Ed, thank you. All right, very nice. So uh, yes, I enjoyed working with you many years and uh, gave a couple of talks there. And always had a great time at Rittenhouse Astronomical Society. I tell people about the lunar module that's out there, uh, among other things, and the great sky shows you put on. And I'll be talking a little bit about the, the sky shows too. So uh, all right, so let's get into it. Um, all right, so what should I do now? Hit share screen again? Ted, can you hear me? No, now I cannot hear you. You're muted. Okay. Now can you hear me? No, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Yes. Go down right. to share screen. Should be at the Go bottom button. Share screen, yeah, that's what I was just saying. Okay, very good. So I'll put that on, share that. Okay. So now you can uh, hopefully see my presentation. We're on your first slide, Ken, take it away. All right, very good. So again, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. And we'll talk about resurgence in human spaceflight in America, as well as the Perseverance Mars rover. So uh, we just had a human spaceflight launch, finally, about a week and a half ago. And um, the picture on the left, you can see me there with the Crew Dragon, which will be the major topic tonight. Uh, at the pad, I get up close with everything. And so my website, Space Up Close, that's where the name is derived from. And here's the, the, the website link, spaceupclose.com. Very, very, uh, very simple to remember. And um, so the other topic we'll be talking about Mars. You know, uh, I gave you a couple of talks about Mars, Mars rovers. This is one of the mosaics I put together from the Curiosity Mars rover that landed on Mars in 2012, about eight years ago. And now we have Perseverance that's on the way there. And here I am with a mock-up of it. And uh, notice, uh, this is at the Kennedy Space Center press site. Notice I have my mask there and here because we live, we live in COVID times now. And it's very restricted and very hard to get on base. And the press site is actually closed. We only have outside events now. So uh, yeah, it's impacting everything. All right, 
So from there, now I want to talk about, let's see. How does this picture advance? Page down. Why is it not advancing? Um, why is it not advancing? Okay, there it is. All right. It did Good. you've you're advanced? All right. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Good. So, like we were talking, um, this is an astronomy club. I'm going to start off with a with an astro photo, something I took last night. I took a couple of these uh, in progress, but they're very much last night because uh, tonight I'm giving the talk. I took this at about seven. And last night we had a launch, and that's what you see up here, another Starlink launch about two hours later, just 24 hours ago. So I had to take this picture. Why is this important? Because this is the topic for tonight. You know, we want to we wanna go back to the moon and then on to Mars. And so what do you see in the night sky now? Ted will, I mean, uh, yeah, Ted will be able to tell you more details when he does his sky talk later. But there's the moon. This is a little bit uh, overblown. This is my backyard. I have a beautiful view. There's Mars. There's the moon at why and Mars as as um, Ted can tell you, you know we we just had the closest approach in in about 15 years. So I hope you guys had a chance with the telescopes or the virtual telescopes to see it because it's not going to be this good again until uh, 2035. But this is where we want to send people. We want to send people back to the moon and then on to Mars and then over here we have you know the, the other two planets. We have Jupiter here. And we have Saturn here. Now, right now, you know, they'll be longer term for, for human uh, exploration. But right now, we have the Juno Jupiter orbiter in polar orbit around uh, Jupiter. And um, we're getting ready to send the Europa Clipper in a few years. And that's going to explore the moon Europa, which is a really exciting moon that orbits Jupiter. And uh, it's got, you know, water geysers. And we think. An ocean beneath, and so there will be uh, that that orbiter going there. It'll be the first um, really high detailed orbiter since Galileo. The Juno orbiter is looking more at the atmosphere and the interior, not with high resolution cameras. But this is going to go do many flybys of Europa, and hopefully determine if there is really a liquid ocean there, and, and possibly if there's organic molecules spewing out from the cracks in the surface there. So. It's a really beautiful time to look out the night sky. This is looking out my backyard, actually, right out the window to my to my right here. Again, we have the moon. And today, the moon's probably blocking Mars. So that's why, again, no, I wanted to get this shot today. Uh, you know, earlier in the week, the moon was here, and it's crossing the sky uh, as the nights progress. And then Ju Jupiter and Saturn. All right. So Ted will tell you more about that later. All right, so what do we have now with NASA? We have developing for the last 10 years, three human pathways to space. Until now, since the retirement of the shuttle in 2011, we haven't been able to launch you. So this is the first year we actually launched humans from American soil on American rockets here in 2020. The last time was July 2011, nine years ago. That's a really long time. And whose fault is that? That's the politicians' fault in both parties, okay? because they didn't fund NASA projects and they shut down the shuttle, which in my opinion should have continued. But anyway, now we're developing since then commercial crew. These are private spacecraft developed by SpaceX, which you see here on the top left and the Boeing Starliner on the top right. They developed these space taxis to get our astronauts to space to the International Space Station, which Ted, you were just talking about there. And I'm going to talk about the space station because this is the 20th year since occupation, permanent occupation of humans in space started 20 years ago in November, basically this month. Yeah. And so a lot of the technology that we're going to use to go to the moon and Mars, we're developing that and testing that out on the space station where we have people constantly there now. And now where we can finally launch our people and international partners back to the station from American soil. So we're developing the Boeing Starliner. And then to go to the moon, we are developing the Orion. 
uh, deep space capsule. These are all my pictures. Most of the pictures you see tonight are mine. When they're NASA pictures, I'll, I'll point that out. And that's part of Project Artemis, which, you know, we want to try to land people back on the moon by 2024. Very ambitious. The first woman and the next man may not happen by then. And we'll have to see what happens with the new administration, what exactly the priorities will be. But anyway, we're going from no human path to space to free. And Starliner, I mean, uh, Dragon launched, just launched. Starliner, we'll talk about it in a minute. They had a test flight, and Orion should launch the first time next year, late next year. All right. So let's start with Crew One. That's the name of the mission, SpaceX Crew One. Did, uh, did any of you see that launch, at least online, or hear about it? I hope. If anybody could say anything. Uh, Following, I followed it on your Facebook page. Great, great. Hopefully you, uh, you good, excellent, because they just launched literally a week and a half ago. That's why it's really good to have this talk now. They launched to the ISS. This is my picture. This is the countdown clock. And right in back of it, you see pad 39A, the crew access arm, and that is the Falcon 9 rocket and the crew dragon right on top of it. So everything what I'm telling you is really topical. But to get there, we had to do a couple of test flights. So last year, you might have heard about the first SpaceX mission, which was uncrewed, unmanned, no people aboard, um, Crew Dragon, and that's the Falcon 9 rocket down here. And then here's a close up of the Crew Dragon. That's the crew access arm. The astronauts take an elevator, they go up, and then they walk across. They're already spacesuited, they enter the capsule. And then here's the launch test flight, worked beautifully. That was back, uh, hopefully, you can see it. It looks like it might be covered by. Uh, the people's pictures, but that was in March of 2019. So that was just about a year and a half ago. We had to do test flights on crew before we put people on. People are very, very precious, obviously. And so then here's the briefing after the launch. And uh, here you can see Elon Musk. Uh, there's me, show you, I was there. And this is pre-COVID times. Nobody has masks on, everybody's together. It seems so foreign now. Although that's how we lived our whole life, but everything's been upended in the last six months. So there's Elon Musk. Now there's the crew, the first astronauts to launch. Of course, this is before they launched. That's a Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. That's a NASA administrator, uh, Jim Bridenstine, Kirk Sharman, the ISS director. So there's me. Here's a wide shot of the uh, of, of of the briefings. This is where we hold the briefings. Uh, that's me right there. So I'm in the briefing room. So it's always uh, pretty spectacular to be there, uh, seeing this stuff up close. That's why I call my space, my website space up close. And I have articles, new articles just about every day. So after that uh, uncrewed test flight from uh, uh, Bo uh, SpaceX, we then had another uncrewed test flight from the Boeing Starliner. That's the second way to get to the space station. First, because um, NASA gave two contracts out to SpaceX and to Boeing. So Boeing, everybody thought they'd be first. They weren't, they launched second, their uncrewed test flight. That was last Christmas. Uh, here's again, my pictures here. We see the rollout of the capsule um, before they uh, attached it to the rocket. So then at pad 41, they attach it to the top of this Atlas rocket. SpaceX launches on a Falcon 9 and Boeing launches on a ULA, United Launch Alliance rocket. That's an Atlas V. Here you can see up close. And again, they have their crew access arm right here. Here is the Starliner under construction. Uh, that's the next one. And so they had their test flight and, uh, and it, the launch went great. ULA rocket performed perfectly, Atlas V. Unfortunately, the capsule you see up here did not, did not. It never got to the space station. So they're gonna have to do a next one. That mission was, um, they, they had a major malfunction at uh, just just after separation, a few minutes into the flight, about 10, 15 minutes into the flight, I don't remember the exact time, but it what happened was the Boeing Starliner fired its thrusters. It should not have fired the thrusters at that point. It fired it, used up all the fuel because it didn't know exactly where it was. So that put them behind. Here's my uh, launch shot, streak shot, we call it a streak shot from the VAB. Here's an up close of the engines. So the rocket performed perfectly. Eventually, they got the capsule back after three days, did not get to the space station. So they're going to have to do a new test flight. This was called OFT, Orbital Flight Test. They're going to do a new one 
which you'll hear about uh, sometime this spring after Christmas, maybe January, February, March, something like that. Uh, so they have to do another uncrewed test flight before they can put people on. And that'll hopefully happen uh, later this year, but at least we have SpaceX. So SpaceX then uh, in May, they launched actually the two astronauts, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley. Here's a shot of mine because of because because of COVID, everything is highly restricted now. In the last few months, it's very hard to get to, very hard to get access anymore to the space center. So these are my shots um, uh, showing the capsule and the rocket on the pad from actually a prior mission, um, in-flight abort test. So they launched anyway on May 30th. Spectacular! Uh, it was delayed a couple of days because. There's always bad weather in the, in, in the summer here and the torrential rains and that's still continuing. So we finally launched three days later instead of May 27th, we launched May 30th during the day. And here's my launch shots. And um, you can see here's the VAB. I forgot that the Rittenhouse is on. This is right where I live. That's the vehicle assembly building. That's where the Apollo moon rockets were assembled. That's where the space shuttle orbiters were assembled. And then here you see the rocket taken off. There's a close up, here's a wide view. You can see the Falcon 9 with the two astronauts and the crew dragon on top. Uh, and so if you wanna see a launch, you wanna come to Titusville, that's where I live. It's really the best place to see a launch because as you see in this picture, there's basically nothing in the way. You see the launch pads. If you go to other places like uh, the beaches in Port Canaveral and Cape, Can and Cape uh, Cocoa Beach and Cape Canaveral, they're, they're all blocked by trees until you get to the beach. But even there, you don't have a good view of the pad. But if you're in Titusville, you got a clear view of all the pads. So this is the best place really to watch these uh, launches from. So completely successful mission. They were there about two months when they launched. They didn't know the two astronauts, how long they would be there. It was a test flight. And that's kind of like the first time in NASA history. They didn't know when the astronauts would come back because it was a test flight. Originally, it was only going to be a two-week mission. But because we don't have any more seats on the Russian Soyuz, uh, they wanted them to stay longer. And so they did, the two guys. And uh, there were only three astronauts and cosmonauts up on a space station at that time. So they really uh, were a very welcome addition. Because if you only have three people on the ISS, you can't do a lot of science. You have to do a lot of maintenance. So with those two extra guys up there for two months, they actually did a bunch of spacewalks and they swapped out new batteries that were brought by a Japanese cargo ship. Um, because besides sending astronauts, we have to send cargo. You have to send all the food, you have to send the oxygen, you have to send supplies, you have to send replacement parts. And that is done on other ships from Europe, from Japan, from Russia, and also from the United States. We have like four or five different uncrewed cargo ships that bring all those supplies and the science experiments that the uh, ISS is designed for. So after two months, you know, they, 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 did, they swapped out those batteries. That was a major help, major aid to the space station program. And then the, the capsule landed in the Gulf. Again, the weather was bad in the Atlantic, so they had to land in the Gulf. And they, were, they, were, they landed in the ocean, unlike, you know, just like Apollo, unlike the shuttle that landed back at the Kennedy Space Center, like an airplane, right? They land in the ocean. Uh, in this case, in the Gulf of Mexico. And then that was scooped out of the water and brought back here to Port Canaveral. And here you can see the scorched capsule, right? There's the hatch where the astronauts exit right there. And uh, so they were in the Gulf. They got them out about an hour after the splashdowns. It was all very successful. And so that set us on the path to what just happened basically last week, which is the a normal mission. This was a test flight. So, um, Let's talk about that a little bit more. So now we have a real mission. We call it a crew rotation mission. This is a normal mission, which is six months, not a test flight. We call it the first operational mission. It's called Crew-1, all right? NASA SpaceX Crew-1. It's sponsored by NASA. NASA pays SpaceX uh, money um, to launch the astronauts, and they put NASA money and SpaceX money into the development. Same thing with the Boeing Starliner. And now we have a crew of four. Okay, instead of two. So this is the first time we have four people in a capsule. With Apollo, the maximum was three. The shuttle was not a capsule. It could carry anywhere from two to seven. So we have four on this mission called Crew One. And there you see their patch. And you can buy them as a really very cool patch. 
And uh, this just happened a week and a half ago. They flew in from Houston to get ready for the flight. And um, and uh, here, here are their names. It's Mike Hopkins. Three of these people are veterans. He's the commander of the flight, Victor Glover. He is um, the pilot. And that's the first African-American to do a long duration flight to the ISS. There have been many African-American astronauts. This is the first one to do a long duration flight. So, and he's a rookie, so he's extremely happy. The other two, the other three are all veterans, but everybody's always happy when they can fly. That's Shannon Walker. She did a six month mission before. And that's uh, uh, Suichi Noguchi. He's from Japan. So he's the first international astronaut to launch on these American commercial spaceships. So uh, there was a lot of firsts in this new mission, in this next mission that just launched a week and a half ago. And they're there at the space station right now. And there will be more international astronauts and there will be more women. She actually joins another woman who was up there. I'll show you the picture in a moment. So here they are on the crew access arm. Okay, this is a practice before. And then here's a look inside the Crew Dragon where they're seated. Crew Dragon can hold four astronauts at a time, four passengers at a time. So um, here's my picture from last week, pre-launch shot right from the pad as we were getting ready to launch. A little bit of a gloomy day. It's always a lot of a lot of uh, uh, a lot of clouds and a lot of rain. They call it the sunshine state, but it's really the the rainy state and the hurricane state, also. So uh, what I'm showing you here, you see, here's where they, they 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 go up the elevator, and then here's the entrance to the crew access arm. They walk down that, and that's where this picture is from. That picture is taken right here, and then here they're seated, and that's so they walk down. And they can see out the windows here, really cool. And uh, then they bo board the capsule. They're already spacesuited. They board the capsule, of course. There's plenty of technicians to help them get seated. And now here's uh, some more of my shots, close-up shots. Here you see the whole capsule. And look at this. We have a NASA meatball and a NASA, I mean, a NASA meatball and a NASA worm. If you're, if you're not too much into space, you don't know what that means. But these are the two logos from NASA. Original logo is called the meatball, all right? It's blue. And we'll see a close-up of that in a minute. And then that was replaced in the 70s with the worm. And so now the worm is back and for people who know space. And so now they put both of them on there and it is really, really cool. So here's the side view. Again, you see the crew access arm. Here's actually the uh, seal right here. And they land this rocket, okay? These are the close-up views of the landing legs. Why is this important? I'll tell you why it's important, because they want to reuse these rockets. SpaceX reuses their rockets. No other company in the world reuses the rockets. The space shuttle was reusable for the most part. Okay, they recovered the boosters and they recovered the orbiter. They did not recover the big core stage in, in, in the center. But SpaceX recovers their liquid-fueled uh, booster. That's the first one to be recovered. And those are the landing land. Why is this important again? Because they're going to reuse it, and they're going to reuse it on the next mission called crew two six months from now. And so in order to reuse it, you have to land it and they, 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 they recover it by landing on land or at sea. I'll show you a little bit more of that in a moment. So here's now a close up of the, of the capsule there. You see the two logos. You're from very familiar with this one, probably the meatball and that's the worm. This came out in 1776 on the 200th anniversary of the country. And then it went back to the meatball and now, now we use both of them. Now NASA uses both of them. So it's really cool to see that there. These are my pictures from just a week and a half ago. There's the umbilicals. Here's again how the astronauts enter and you see this seal here, hermetically sealed, environmentally controlled. And here, if there is an issue, uh, if there's an emergency with the rocket on the pad or in flight, they can abort. These are the Super Draco abort thrusters. And there are four of them with uh, eight thrusters, there's two thrusters in each one, and it pulls the rocket away in case of a rocket emergency, either if at the pad, if there's an emergency at the pad, or all the way to space, they can abort, all right? And then here, the nose cone, I wanna show you this, this is important because later you're gonna see uh, that nose cone is gonna flip flip up, it's gonna flip open, and that's how you dock to the ISS. This has to, this has to come undone here in order to dock to the ISS because the docking ring is right there. So, and there's me setting up my cameras. You see how close we get. 
We're inside the pad right here. We protect them from the rain. There's a lot of rain. And in fact, that this weather, this launch got delayed because of rain also, um, but it's just totally spectacular to be there. And then we had actually two launches almost on top of one another when Crew-1 launched. We also had an Atlas. Again, you see that here. Um, you see that here taken off with a mock-up of the Crew Dragon because while the media events were ongoing for Crew-1, we also had an Atlas launch, okay? Launching a spy satellite that protects us. This is how we monitor the communications from our adversaries, from Kim Jong-un and from Putin and from, you know, Chinese, uh, Chinese, all those dictators who, who don't mean us well. Well, this is how we monitor them with the spy satellites. So these are critical to launch these. And so I got a once in a lifetime shot of the Atlas rocket. I'm really happy with this shot. The Atlas rocket taken off uh, it, with in the foreground. This is a mock-up Crew Dragon, but it's very good replica to the real Crew Dragon that sat in on the pad just over here to the left. So we had two rockets on two launch pads. They launched two days apart. They were gonna launch one day apart, but because of the bad weather, they each got delayed and it wound up being two days apart, but real exciting. So once in a lifetime shot, cause you know, this does not sit here all the time. It's only there for our media events of a couple of days. And uh, so it was just spectacular. And then here you see, it was very cloudy for this Atlas launch. It, uh, it disappeared into the clouds and then it reappeared. And then, uh, now here, if Jared is still online, hopefully he is. Actually, my friend, here he is right here. He's a good prop. See, he's <laughs> aiming his camera right, right up there. That is the Atlas rocket taken off. Here it is, the nose cone. Here is pre-launch shot. And here is the Atlas rocket streaking. It's beautiful. It's got solid rocket boosters. So again, a once in a lifetime shot with a SpaceX Crew Dragon mock-up. There's, the, um, there's the countdown clock. And the actual Crew Dragon waiting to launch is just right over here in the background. And there's the US flag and the uh, Crew Dragon flag right there. So it was really just absolutely spectacular. Here's another friend of mine from another uh, media outlet that TV News, he's, he's doing a live shot right here. Again, there's the crew, the US flag, crew flag. There is the countdown clock, the SpaceX Dragon. And there's Jared. Jared, I hope you're still here. And there he is right there. So he was a really great prop. So, and he was on the other side. I was on this side. So that's where I wanted to be. So I was real happy. Here's the NASA administrator who I know personally, Jim Bridenstine does a great job. Again, here's the mock-up of the Crew Dragon. Here's the hatch. This is how they enter. There's a, another astronaut there. There's Bob Cabana. He, now you're talking about the ISS, right? Well, the ISS started 20 years ago with continuous human occupation. He was the commander of the space shuttle flight, um, Bob Cabana, that launched the first US element, the Unity module of the ISS. It docked with the Russian space station module. And together that was the beginning of the space station. So that was the astronaut, the commander, Bob Cabana. And now he's director of the Kennedy Space Center. And uh, so we're all there. That's me. This is a NASA shot. They just happened to put this online. There's, again, Bridenstine. Cabana is back here. And there's our crew dragon. And then the VAB is over, over, over to the left there. So real exciting. This is just a week and a half ago. So again, really topical. Really important because we're back into space. We're not dependent on the Russians anymore. So here's the launch. There you see the pad for free launch. It was a night launch. Uh, was going to be 2.30 in the morning but, and at Halloween, but it, it got delayed for some reviews and weather. And so then it turned into about uh, 7.30 at night. So it was early evening. And there's the, there's the Crew Dragon. That's where the astronauts are for the Crew-1 mission. They are here. Really kind of a weird shot. And again, here's the uh, preview shot with the four astronauts sitting there. And that they are right there in that Crew Dragon. All right. And again, now we doubled from this mission, we went from two to four, and that's going to be normal. We'll normally have four people. And this is important because now we can have seven people at the space station where we've had six before. So here's another launch shot, beautiful reflection in the water. Again, just from just over a week ago, here's a streak shot. Uh, this is where you leave the camera open for about uh, four or five minutes. There's a lot of light. It's, it's hard to do it. You can't let the camera wiggle, but... Uh, 
but uh, but but real happy. And then there's another launch rock, another launch pad there, and another launch pad there. Actually, the Atlas launch pad is right there. So uh, where where that where that other rocket launched a few days ago, the Atlas. Uh, this is the SpaceX Dragon on its way to space station, and uh, everything went just beautifully. And like I said, we recovered the rocket. So before we get to the space station, I just want to show you how we recovered the rocket. So remember those those landing legs. They were they were uh, flush against, folded up, flush against the core, right? Now you see they're deployed. So when we land, they deploy just moments before, literally moments before it lands, and it lands on this barge, and here it is coming into Port Canaveral. It got, lands in the ocean, lands in the Atlantic Ocean on a thing the size of a parking lot, and not very big, and has to be a precision landing. This one landed with a little bit of tilt, but again, we want to use this for the next crew, crew two. What's interesting about that too, for four people, it will also have the wife of Bob Benkin on there, who was on the Demo-2 mission. So uh, he tested out the, the spacecraft and the capsules and, and it's all good. So now he's willing to sacrifice his wife and put his wife on there after he tested it out first. And see, you can see all this in this shot. Again, this is just, this was a week ago. It takes a couple of days for it to come back. So Jared was here too, if he's, he's somewhere in this picture, over to the left here. And so you can see this, the public, if you come down here, Port Canaveral, where the cruise ships are, the biggest cruise ship terminal in the world is right here at Port Canaveral, which is right next to Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center. Of course, there's no cruises right now, so it's pretty quiet. But the point is, you see, you can watch all of these things this is public and you get real close and you can see these boosters and see they were white. Now they got soot on them, like a lot of soot. Now we just launched a SpaceX rocket last night. That was the first picture I showed you. The first one to launch seven times. So that was a history making rocket. So there's a lot to see here if you come down here. Okay, so now let's get back to crew one. All right, here they are. Here's an interior shot. Okay, as they're approaching the space station now, they also have a zero G indicator. And guess what he is? Baby Yoda. <laughs> Look, there's Baby Yoda. He makes an appearance. Baby Yoda. Zero G indicator. He's just floating. Look at him. Look at him right there. You see that? That's mm -hmm. Baby Yoda. I didn't even really know about Baby Yoda. I love Star Wars, but the original ones, not, not the current ones. And there's Baby Yoda floating. And that's what they do. They, they have these things in their spacecraft. And that's when, when they're flying and they get up about eight and a half minutes and the pull of gravity ends, they know that there's no more gravity. People can see that because this thing is just floating around in the cabin, floating freely. Uh, on the last flight, Demo 2, you might've heard about the dinosaur, Tremor, okay? And on the Demo 1 flight, you might've heard about uh, th that Earth. Hmm? Planet Earth, right. It was the planet Earth, the good Earth. And, and so everybody went out and bought it. And so we went out and bought Baby Yoda, okay? <laughs> and he's a now our launch mascot. And so we bring him as good luck. And he was good luck last night. We launched last night. An hour before the launch, it was pouring rain. And then it suddenly cleared. And we actually saw the launch to our great surprise. So there's always something going on. So now here's the SpaceX Crew Dragon. Now, these are not my shots, okay? I wish they were, mm -hmm. but this is not my shot. All right, and so remember I told you the nose cone would open, so here it is. Here's the docking ring, and here it is attached into the space station, okay? And this is the same port where the space shuttle used to dock. So there's the nose cone open, and it's going to stay open until they come back. Then it has to close, and the parachutes are below here. So when they land, when they come back to Earth, it will, it will again, it will be uh, deployed, and the parachutes will come out, but that's six months from now. So there they landed. Here's the crew. So we, you saw them uh, in the shots before. Now here they are in the space station. Took 27 hours to get there. So here's crew one in the red shirts. And here's the three crew members who were there before. That's Kate Rubin. So now we have two American women. Okay. And she launched here. She launched here on a Russian Soyuz with the two Russian guys, both named Sergei. Okay. And that's, this has been the only way we could get to space for the last nine years. Now, we're still going to launch on them, but we are not dependent on the Russians anymore, okay? And that's good, because if the Russians have a problem, which they did a year and a half ago, there was a manned flight that aborted for the first time in, like, since 84, 
in 30 years with um, U.S. astronaut Nick Hague on there. So now if something happens to the Soyuz, we have a backup system with the Crew Dragon and hopefully the Starliner will come on, on board soon too. And, uh, and then there's Kate Rubens, this is the pre-launch shot. And so they launched on that Soyuz, which is normally very reliable, extremely reliable rocket. Uh, when they had that launch abort, one of these uh, first stage boosters did not deploy right. I do a lot of interviews and here you see the VAB in back of me. And again, that's where the launch pads are. So pad 39A, where we launch our astronauts from um, on the Crew Dragon is basically right here. And uh, so if you look at my website, look at my Twitter page, follow me, or if you look at my Facebook page, uh, you see a lot of these shots. So I do a lot of interviews. In fact, I did two interviews this week on, on all these missions. So here's the space station. Here they docked. Um, and they docked right here. That's where the shuttle docked. And now there's an extra little adapter there. This is the Japanese part. So that's why there's a Japanese astronaut, because it's not just an American space station. It's called the International Space Station, because there's like 15 countries involved. So this is the Russian part here. This is the, the first US part, Unity. That's what Bob Cabana brought up 20 years ago. This was the core. This was the core of the space station one American module and two Russian modules. And then gradually we built out, uh, Japanese added the Kibo module and the Europeans added the Columbus module. Here you see the Bigelow, that is the inflatable habitat that's been there now for a few years. And then there are some more US modules when the American astronauts take spacewalks, they exit here at the Quest airlock. And uh, the Soyuz docks here, they got about four or five ports where they can dock, there's another one. So that's what the space station looks like today. And that's where we're conducting, uh, you know, all of our research. Here's a, a schematic. This shows where Crew Dragon 1 docked. Okay, again, you see the nose cone there, docked. That's where the shuttle used to dock. We have Cygnus. Now, why is that important? You guys are in Pennsylvania. As I mentioned when I was talking up there, you can see launches from Virginia. Okay, all you have to do is drive four hours down to NASA Wallops, Okay, and you can see space station launches. Uh, you can see launches to the International Space Station just a few hours from you. And if you can't make it and it's clear weather, you could actually see it streaking across, across space, space if, if it's at night. So we launched those Cygnus cargo modules from NASA Wallops in Virginia. That's just a four or five hour drive from Pennsylvania, Princeton, New Jersey, and New York and things like that. So you can see that. So that's uh, the way the space station looks now. Uh, here's a schematic. You can see very complicated. It took 20 years, uh, well, 15 years to build the space station. We're going to add some commercial modules coming up now. Um, and again, here is uh, another, another view. So here again, this is where the Crew Dragon, this is a front view, showed you a side view before. So there's a front view. That's where the uh, Crew Dragon and the shuttle docked. And I think here's a, here's a bigger one. So I want to go through some 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 facts and figures. Um, yeah, over 240 individuals from 19 countries have visited the ISS, continuously occupied since November 2000. So this is the 20th anniversary of the ISS. That's why that talk you're gonna have from that other gentleman in a few months is so important. The space station is there for science, okay? Doing a lot of pharmaceutical work. I'm a pharmaceutical chemist. So what I'd say is I'd be working on COVID today if I wasn't retired. That's what I used to do. It's very important work. A lot of material science. There's a lot of astronomy that's done there. You know, we have the uh, cosmic ray detector there, the AMS, looking for dark matter, dark energy. Okay, how did the universe form? When did it form? All of that is done on the space station. We monitor the weather, we monitor the climate. You know, there's a lot of work on the astronauts themselves to, to test the impact of space on the human body. We have the year long missions, because when we go to Mars, that's three years round trip. So we need to have more year long missions. Uh, so the maximum until now was six. Now, since a week and a half ago, now for the first time we have seven people living and working permanently on the ISS. They will rotate of course, but that seventh person will be able to double the output of science because that seventh person is gonna be mostly devoted to science. Um, so we're going to we're going to more than double the science output that we can do on the ISS by adding this one person. So that's why Crew Dragon and Boeing Starliner 
are so important. We're still launching with the Russians. They, they can only have three, but now we can have U.S. also. So we can have three on one side and we can have four on the other side. So that makes seven. And they could even have more after that. So, uh, so um, yeah, so it's just a spectacular 20 years. Peggy Whitson, a woman, has spent the most time on the ISS. The longest time is... Uh, is uh, Scott Kelly the year-long mission? But she and uh, and um, and uh, Christina Koch, who was there last year, she's just like three weeks shy, two or three weeks shy of uh, Scott Kelly. So we have men and we have women, we have international astronauts, we have all kinds of people working on space. So everybody can be, everybody, every race is involved, every nationality can be involved in space which is there to benefit us. It's not just to sit there. It's to do work, to do science work and to explore the moon, Mars, and beyond. That's what ISS, that's what NASA is all about. And that's what Mars is all about. We wanna find life beyond Earth. And don't forget, you can see the ISS in the sky. These are some of my shots, 30, 30 second street shots. You could see this in Pennsylvania even. Okay, definitely at Muddy Run, you know, take a look at the Spot the Station website from NASA, and you can see when it's gonna be overhead. And it could be like a minute, could be like six, six minutes, could be a few degrees above the horizon, or could be way above the horizon. We just had one that lasted six minutes a few days ago, and it went up to 76 degrees, and it was six minute long. It was absolutely spectacular. It is the brightest object in the night sky, brighter than Venus, okay? So you know how Ve you know how bright Venus is because you're astronomers, right? I hope. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. imagine something brighter than Venus moving across the sky. That's what you can see. And I know some of you are astrophotographers, so you can take shots just like this. So uh, the last the last thing we have is Orion going to the moon. Okay, we have Project Artemis just announced a few two or three years ago. And uh, we want to land the first woman and the next man by 2024. Very ambitious. Probably won't happen by 2024, but we need that ambitious target so we get there eventually. Okay, here's uh, Bridenstine and Cabana again from a, a meeting we had. Here's the Orion capsule. Okay, and we're going to the South Pole. Now, we've never been to the South Pole with Apollo. Okay, we're always at equatorial regions. And, uh, and so... I'll talk more about that in a moment while we're going to the South Pole. So here's a close-up of Orion, my close-up Orion shots. Okay, here's the engines at the bottom of the SLS rocket that will launch it. And uh, those are recycled from the space shuttle. This is the core stage. Is a lot of it that is derived from the space shuttle as the mobile launcher that will take it out to space. And then we're going to launch Orion to meet the Gateway uh, mini space station, the mini ISS we are building called Gateway. That'll be in orbit around the moon. So here are the Apollo landing sites, mostly equatorial. Artemis wants to go to the South Pole, okay? Why, why do we wanna go there? The permanently shadowed craters. You know what's in them? Water, water and organic molecules. Well, if you have water, you don't have to bring it, right? And what can you do with the water? You can make oxygen to breathe and you have hydrogen for fuel, okay? So now you don't have to bring it, you can live off the land. And that's what we wanna do, make it a lot less expensive. We wanna establish a permanent settlement and the best place to do that is going to be down here at the South Pole. And you're all astronomers, so you know we can't really see it because it's the South Pole. But we, uh, we, um, that's where we want to go because they in permanent shadows. And we learned this from the Elkross mission. Okay, when it plunged into the South Pole craters, spewed up material, and then the other spacecraft analyzed it and other telescopes from Earth and found, yeah, there's water there. And there might be organic molecules there. You know where it came from? Comets. You're astronomers, right? You like comets, don't you? Yeah, you like comets. We just saw a comet a couple months ago, right? Pretty spectacular. Well, you know, comets bring the water to the Earth. That's why we're here. That's why we have life on Earth, probably, because a lot of the water came from outer space. And maybe the organic molecules, maybe the amino acids, maybe the magic elixir that started life came from there. And you know what? We just took samples from Bennu, right? Osiris Rex, which I saw that launch too. I was in the clean room with that spacecraft. That's heading back. Well, it will be heading back. We just took that. I hope you guys got to see that, uh, got to see something about that mission. My articles, I have a bunch of articles all about that. So we're trying to build a human lander. 
Okay, so Orion would launch on the SLS dock, maybe with the gateway and then send our people to the moon. NASA has got study contracts with three companies, including SpaceX, uh, Blue Origin leading the national team and Dynetics. So that's all got to be funded by Congress. So we'll conclude with Mars, Perseverance Rover. Okay, this is a follow up, uh, basically a carbon copy of the, of the Curiosity Rover, but with new brand new science instruments. This is an astrobiology mission, the first real astrobiology mission, and it will help us bring samples back. It was launched over the summer during COVID time, so that's why I was wearing a mask. You'll see again in a moment. It's landing in February, and guess what? We just reached the halfway point. We're just under 100 days, so this is a great time for this talk because we're halfway to Mars, okay? That's why I'm talking about it tonight, all right? And what else does it have? It has a helicopter. The helicopter is in the belly. We've never done air, airborne flight at another body. Well, this is carrying, this rover is carrying a helicopter to test that out, to see if we can fly on another planet. And it's important because guess what? Titan, that Ted can show you in the telescope, we are sending a probe, okay, uh, Dragonfly. It's going to launch around 2026. It's going to launch to the moon Titan orbiting Saturn because there's organic molecules there. Again, I'm an organic chemist, real exciting. And they're going to have a little chopper, actually a huge chopper. And it is going to be able to hop from one place to the other on Titan. So this is like a test bed for that also. So it's a very exciting mission. We never had a helicopter before. So here at the press site, you can see scale models of the, of, of the rover and the helicopter. This is exactly the size they would be in proportion to one another. And again, I made this, so I had this, I took this picture specifically to show you how the helicopter will be deployed. It will deploy from the belly, okay? It's gonna drop from the belly and then they're gonna roll the rover away, okay? And then the helicopter, when they get about, I don't know, about a couple hundred feet away, they will test, they will test it about 30 days after the landing, which is gonna be in the March. It's, Got a limited lifetime, so they have to test it out within the first a few months that 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 it lands. Um, the rover itself has seven state-of-the-art instruments, and most of these are designed to collect samples because we're actually for the first time going to collect samples. This is astrobiology. This is the first leg in returning samples from Mars. So that's its main goal: is to find that samples that would be interesting for life because it's going to land at a, at, in an ancient lake bed that had water in the past, the Jezero Crater, take those samples and collect them, and then it's going to drop them on the soil. And guess what? I hope you, um, maybe you have kids, they were involved in the naming contest, okay? So kids are naming our rovers. These are two high school kids, Alex Mather and Venisa Rapuzzi. And I asked them, we, they were there at the, at, the, at the press site when we did the, the launch. I asked them to point to the names, uh, the components that they named. They were the contest winners. And this, he got it just as COVID was hitting. He was the winner. And then they announced her uh, a few weeks later. So he named the rover Perseverance because we're persevering. We have to persevere during COVID, right? We've never faced anything like this in a hundred years since the Spanish flu. So the boy named the rover Perseverance and Ingenuity is a great name for that helicopter because it takes a lot of ingenuity to figure out how to fly on another planet when you've never done it before. And the atmosphere is, you know, a half a percent of the earth, a half a percent of the earth. So it's nothing like, nothing like here. So because of COVID, we were not allowed to go into the clean room this time. So I'll show you my picture of what it did look like when I was there the last time for Curiosity. We landed at Gale Crater again eight years ago. Goal again, search for signs of life. That's what this whole mission is about, curiosity and perseverance. There's the robotic arm. So perseverance is gonna use its robotic arm to collect those samples. Curiosity is still active. You know, I create a lot of mosaics from it. Uh, that was a topic of my previous talks. Here I am with the rover Curiosity. Again, it launched on an Atlas V rocket. There it is inside its nose cone. Same thing with perseverance. Here's a mosaic I created from um, Curiosity. This is the first time we drilled into another planet and it discovered what? It discovered organic molecules. So we know we went to the right place. This was an ancient lake bed. There's Mount Sharp inside Gale Crater. So 
a similar type of environment, but one that we think even has a better chance to hold clay minerals and other preserved signs of, of, of life in the past, or at least organic molecules. So the new rover also has an arm and it is gonna collect those samples. And uh, there's a, I have an unofficial mission guide from uh, Rocket Stem and Space Up Close. I didn't bring it up here with me, but anyway, there's a copy of it. Um, it's on my website, the homepage of my website, Mars 2020 Mission Guide. Got a lot of great pictures, a lot of great articles, and you guys can uh, you guys can take a look at that. You can either download it for free or you can purchase a hard copy. All right, and the link is is there. Or contact me if you're interested. So here's the Atlas V rocket. There's the logo for Mars 2020 Perseverance rover. And here we are at the Atlas launch pad. Again, we're setting up our cameras. Here's my launch, one of my launch shots. Well, again, with setting up the cameras, that's how close we get. Um, and here is a nice uh, uh, gift to show you. There was that launch on July 30th. And we are now at the halfway point. Let's see, where are we? Right here, that's where we are. We're right here right now, okay? And next February 18th, they're gonna intersect Mars and their spacecraft and it's a one-shot deal, do or die. No, no, no turning around, no second chances. So there's Mars 2020 Perseverance. This is a, a, a picture of Mars, a diagram of Mars. Curiosity is here in Gale Crater. There's opportunity and insight. So it's kind of like midway in between them. And again, it's gonna use parachutes, retro rockets. This has an advanced landing system, more advanced landing system than Curiosity. It'll be taking pictures, but it's again, still the seven minutes of terror. It's all autonomous. And so if there is a dangerous spot in the last moment, it can do a divert burn, unlike Curiosity. It can do a divert burn, as you see in this, in this little gif here, and hopefully find a safe area. They told me they got a 98% chance of success with this terrain avoidance radar. This was added. Otherwise, they couldn't go to this particular crater, Jezero, because it's it's even more hairy. It's more difficult to land on than where Curiosity landed on. So again, here's a diagram showing uh, Perseverance. It's going to be collecting samples, sample caching system. Here you see them. It'll collect them, and then it'll drop them on the ground. And then here you see the evolution of the Mars rovers over Martian. And then eventually, in about uh, six, seven years, we're going to send another rover, and it is going to pick up those samples, pick them up off the ground, and then bring them back to another spacecraft. If you've seen the Martian, any of you seen the Martian, he had to have another ship to get back, right? He landed on one ship, and then he launched on another ship. But that's how we're going to get the samples back. Think of the Martian. So it's going to launch them in the MAV, the Martian Ascent Vehicle, and that's going to meet an orbiter overhead. It's going to meet an orbiter overhead. Just like the Martian, think about uh, think about uh, Mark Watney, about uh, um, Matt Damon. He had to push himself to meet to meet that capsule. It's real hairy, but that's what they're going to do. And then that orbiter is going to come back to Earth, and hopefully in around 2031 is the earliest we could get those samples back from Mars. So that's uh, so that's how that'll work. And here's Jezero Crater. So you can see it's, it's a very complicated, very complex uh, landscape, but real scientifically interesting. And because they have this terrain avoidance radar, they can they can avoid the bad spots and land at a safe spot, at least in theory. That's that's the goal. So that's the end of my talk. So um, I just Ken, say that. Ken, um, Ken, back up a slide second. Yep. That is a beautiful shot. Where yes. did you get that from? Uh, I didn't take this picture. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> this is from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Okay. We have spy satellites at Mars. We got three orbiters. One has a really high resolution camera. It's been there since 2005, MRO, and it's called the high rise camera. And it can take highly detailed pictures as well as spectra. Okay, so we can figure out what's the chemistry in this landing site. Now this is right. colored. Okay, there's a little bit of false color there too. Right, right. But it shows you a really great relief of uh, just how exciting, but also how dangerous this landing site is. See, it's not flat. Not where we did with Curiosity, we landed next to a mountain. So, but we landed on a flat area. See, we and then drove, but it, it drove several years to get to the really interesting part, which was the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. Although they did discover the organic molecules right on the crater floor right away. So that was a great 
scientific find that that mosaic that I created that's actually on display at the Air and Space Museum in Washington. But now with this this terrain avoidance radar, they could this this is the alluvial fan. This is where there was a riverbed and and lakes and rivers that spilled out, and this is where they think the organic molecules are here. So they're going to try to land like right in here instead of landing out here and driving for years to get there. They're going to land right there. So yeah, that's Jezero Crater, J E Z E R O. So well, first let me say officially, hey, thank you so much for sharing the information with us. We have some questions lined up here. Yeah. So let me just people... let me just finish up here uh, okay. before we get to the questions. Again, um my pictures are for sale. Um I don't get any money. If you buy something, it's a great time for holiday gifts. Okay, Christmas and other holidays. Um so I have all kinds of pictures available, all the ones I showed you today. And as well as my friend, Jean Wright, she worked on the space shuttle here. Just come on in the picture a minute. She worked <laughs> on the space shuttle. She can give a talk for your club time sometime too. She worked the thermal protection on the space shuttle. That's wow. what is the heat shield that saves it from fabric. thousands of degrees down to like 50 degrees. It dissipates all the heat. And she sewed those fabrics that are on the exterior of the shuttle, did a lot of other special projects, including cutting some fabric for Neil Armstrong that went to the moon. Uh, and she also makes these shirts, the shirt that I have on. Where's the face mask? Let me show the face mask here. You guys need face masks? OK, she's got face masks. And these are space face masks. So they are extra good. Besides Ken. being cool, they're extra good. Well, Some go, go. shirts, ties, lanyards. Ken, 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 oh your link, God. your link to your page will stay on our homepage for about a year. Uh, can you share a link uh, with me so I can put it on our homepage and I'll direct it to her uh, masks and stuff? Oh yes, so sister space creations. I will do that. Sure, thank okay, you. Yeah, I so... should have put it in here. But again, there's her sister. name. Yeah. You can look at Jean Jean Wright. Space mm -hmm. creation. And there's her patch too. Oh, so sister. See, it's so sister space creations. Gotcha. I'll send you those links. Yes. We were what's called the so sisters. And what's Jeanette's last name? Jean Wright. Jean w R I G H T. Wright. Here you can see it in this slide. Gotcha. Hi Jean. Thank you for <laughs> being there and the support in the background. <laughs> She's made a lot of these masks for um. Wow. 800. She even made him Apollo uh, 10 astronaut Tom Stafford. She made about 100 of them. He wow. he was also on the Apollo Soyuz test project. That was the first time the Russians and the Americans linked up in space. That was the precursor to the International Space Station. So important, so important. And uh, we just met him over the summer. So. Um, yeah, so they're very popular with astronauts and everybody else. I have a question from Al Ryan, and he put it sure. in the chat room. So, Al, can you hear me? Do you want to ask it live? Oh, yeah. Um, well, Dr. Krimer, that was very interesting and enlightening. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. I got a question for you. Um, when uh, anecdotally, Sir Edmund Hillary was asked, why did he climb Mount Everest? And of course, his answer was because it was there, embodying, I suppose, some notion of exploration for the sake of exploration. And I can see that when applied to perhaps going to Mars. But Sir Edmund Hillary or no mountaineer ever after ever thought about building a home at the top of Mount Everest for obvious reasons. So. I'm wondering what you think of the notion of colonization of a place like Mars that is so inhospitable to life as we know it. Well, absolutely. In fact, Elon Musk, okay, let me get rid of that cursor. Elon Musk wants to build a city on Mars, okay? That is his whole goal since he started SpaceX, okay? His goal was to get people into space and eventually establish a two-planet civilization. That's what we always all want to do, really. We need to get beyond the Earth because, you know, <laughs> with climate change and everything else and crazy people, you don't know what's going to happen to our planet. So, yes, we definitely want to colonize it. Of course, we, we want to do it responsibly. And when we're looking for these, um, seeing if Mars has microbes, we have to be very careful. If You're probably old enough, I think, 
You might know something about the Andromeda strain. You maybe you saw that movie. When we bring it, those samples back, we got to make sure we protect Earthlings here. But yeah, we want to establish with Project Artemis, we want to establish a sustainable presence presence on the moon, probably at the South Pole, living off the living off living off the land. Okay, so we don't have to bring everything with us. That's very expensive. And same thing at Mars. We could do the same thing. There's a lot of water on Mars. In fact, there's, there are oceans on Mars. There's lakes on Mars. We have new data that just shows they're even more, more widespread than thought. If you go look at the North Pole at Phoenix, one of the mosaics I created from the Phoenix lander, the ice, the water ice is there. You know what it is? It's like three, three inches below, three inches below, less than this depth of this cell phone. We have ice, water ice on Mars. And so that could be mine. All right. And it's easy to get to. All right. And it's pure water ice. So that's that's how we will establish a colony by living off the land. And yeah, we want we definitely want to do it. We're going to learn a lot. We'll develop a lot of technology. We'll have a, another habitat for humanity. I'm a big believer in Star Trek and uh, exploring space. So that's a great question. Hopefully I answered it. Hopefully I answered it for you. Uh, Ken, I'm going to let uh, Tom Q ask a question about the Atlas rocket. Sure. Hi, I was just wondering if that's the same Atlas design from the 1960s. Did somebody do a really good job then, or uh, what? It, what's up it's with a that? derivative. It's a derivative. What what launched John Glenn was an Atlas II. Now we have the Atlas V. So yeah, it's vast. It's not the same Atlas. It's the Atlas family, but it is upgraded. Uh, so some of the some of the systems have a lot of heritage, um, but 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 it's it's vastly upgraded. Uh, there was an Atlas two, three, four, and now we have the Atlas five, and it's going to be evolved into something called the Vulcan Centaur. It'll be replaced, so there won't be any atlases anymore in about three years or so. But from that same pad, it's going to look a lot like the Atlas, um, but 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 they're upgrading it. ULA, United Launch Alliance, is upgrading that rocket. And so it'll continue, but in a different form. But yeah, the heritage goes all the way back to the beginning of the space age, actually. Thanks. Sure. Um, Joel, can you hear me out there? And if not, I can do it for you. I can I can hear you. Okay. You had a question there about, um, I'm looking through the chat room. Yeah, the up. question was just any updates on Boeing's chances of launching launching sometime in the near future because it seems like they've stalled out after the the software failures. Yeah, yeah, they've been working on that for more a year. That launch was exactly a year ago, right around Christmas time. Yeah, they didn't do an end to end test, and I didn't mention this before, but you know when they came back after the 72 hours, they had another issue. And they almost, they was only discovered two hours before separation. That's the, the Boeing capsule and the, and the service module could have collided and that would have been a disaster. So they had to quickly send a software patch to do that. So they've been working on all the software patches. They think sometime in the first quarter, probably won't be January, but hopefully February, March, maybe April, they will do their uncrewed test flight. And then I actually just met, um, one of the astronauts who's going to be on that on that mission, SUNY Williams, she's going to she's going to fly on the Starliner, um, and she said there. To, she told me at actually Crew One, they're making a lot of progress, but there won't be a crew test flight probably until later this uh, later 2021. Right, we're still in this year, not next year. So maybe maybe nine months from now we'll have a crew flight with Starliner. In the meantime, we're going to continue with SpaceX. We just had Crew-1. Crew-2 is going to launch end of March. Crew-3 will launch about six months later in October. They're about every six months, so twice a year. And then Starliner will probably go just before or just after Crew-2. But the critical one, as you mentioned, is Orbital Flight Test 2. That has to go well first. It has to go perfect. Um, and that is, we don't have an exact date. They're talking about first quarter. Ken, this is a question from me, and it kind of leads us to next, uh, our January speaker. Um, Sean uh, left the military service and fell in with Bigelow. Uh -huh. And uh, he was responsible to help, it was either deploy or develop the beam. 
uh, Beam, that little module. The, on the, yeah, on that the module line. that you're showing up there. Two things. One is I was wondering how long has that beam been there? And um, do you, are you aware? I think the guy who's behind Bigelow is a hotel magnet, and yes. he wants to have the first modules on the moon and Mars. So yeah. I was wondering, how are they going to get this cargo up? I mean, we our cargo our cargo liner was the space shuttle, and we took all this cargo. Are we going to build these things up there, or are we going to how we get them up there? Well. The beam was launched inside the trunk of the SpaceX Dragon, okay, okay. The cargo Dragon, because it was right. small enough because it inflated in space. But that was the whole point, right? Inflated in space, but in the cargo module, it was okay. very tightly compact. So once right. they get in space, they they gradually uh, open it up and pressurize it. So it takes up a lot less volume. In but, fact, that's yeah, that's how you got. In Go ahead. That's how he got involved in the space station right. because he's now, once they tried to figure out how to hook that there and they wanted to bring these laboratories up to manufacture in space, yeah. he's now on the space station side uh, coordinating right. that effort. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, Bigelow, they, they did have very grandiose plans and they were going to follow up with a commercial module at the, yeah. uh, almost at the end of the space station where the cargo, uh, the crew dragon docks now. They right. would have to add some more docking uh, collars and adapters so that the other, so the Crew Dragon could still dock and, and they could have that Bigelow module there. Unfortunately, Bigelow ran out of time. Yeah, he's a hotel magnet, very yeah. visionary. The beam is still there. I showed it in one of my pictures. It's still, yeah. it was only going to be there like 90 days and then six months. Now it's a permanent feature on the space station. <laughs> Right, All right. right. It's 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 that's why I pointed it out on, on, on the slide. So it's it's really cool, very cool thing. And um long past its um long past its um, a minimum date, right? Yeah. So, well he also had dreams of stringing a whole bunch of them together and making the first hotel up there. The B three thirty, yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, it took too long to develop <laughs> the dragon and the starliner. These things were supposed to be launching in 2015, 2016, 2017, but they got delayed because there were a lot of technical reasons. Boeing still hasn't made it for that reason. Right. SpaceX beat Boeing out to everybody's surprise. Right. But because of these delays, okay, because of, and the delays were caused by you know, shortfalls in Congress from all the politicians. I don't want to take side, but I'm for okay. science. So if you know who's for science, you know who I'm for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to say it. All right. Gotcha. Um, but unfortunately, so there's a lot of blame in both parties to go around. And I just hope Artemis will continue. But um, the trouble is it took so long that he laid off all the people at Bigelow. They, they don't really exist anymore, sadly. They had a great program and Beam was a fantastic demonstration that worked but it's not gonna be followed up on anymore. Now there's another company called Axiom that is gonna launch um, some commercial modules and they're, they're hoping to do what Bigelow did. They wanna have a commercial space station, not maybe most a hotel really, but a few people. And uh, you might've heard about this Tom Cruise flight. Okay, Axiom is actually sponsoring that too, right? Tom Cruise is gonna go film a movie Maybe next year or the year after, he's going to launch on a SpaceX Crew Dragon uh, with his producer and maybe one or two other people because they can have four people besides uh, us. They can have three besides the astronaut, so four all together. So they're going to have a, a former NASA astronaut, Michael Lopez Alegria, who's one of the most experienced uh, NASA astronauts, flew at least four times. And so... Um, commercialization of the space station having space tourists now it can happen it can happen but unfortunately bigelow ran out of time and money and he kind of he got frustrated but yes he was going to do that hotels in space he was going to do it on the moon too he wanted to land these modules on the moon okay and you know yeah. it was a little bit pie in the sky but he really proved with beam that he could do it and he had two other modules precursor modules up there that are still working, Genesis 1 and 2. So uh, it's a great concept. It came originally from NASA technology, and then he developed it in the private industry. But see, it takes a lot of money 
So you got to have public-private partnership. This is what SpaceX and Boeing are doing, public-private partnerships. And in fact, on the, the next Cargo Dragon, which is going to launch in about a week and a half, we're going to have two, crew, two dragons up there soon on December 5th. They're bringing a commercial airlock for science. Okay, that's going to be the first commercial airlock for science at the space station. So more commercial companies are getting involved Okay, and that's going to help cut the costs and make more opportunities available for more research. So Bigelow's kind of out of the picture, but other people are coming. That's what I want. That's what I want you to know. Other people, other companies are coming, and um, this commercial airlock's going to be real exciting. Going in the in the trunk on December fifth, the trunk. That's the bottom. That's basically the service module in the in the uh, in the dragons. But it has room in the trunk. So it's like a trunk in your car that can put stuff inside it. Okay. And then the robotic arm pulls it out. It pulls out science experiments and it's going to pull out this commercial airlock from NanoRacks. It's from NanoRacks, actually. Hmm. So, is there any other questions out there? So, I'd like to make an observation, everybody. Thanks, you, Ken. Thank you so much for doing that for us. Um, had a long talk, a long heart-to-heart -heart talk with uh, our executive director today, Renee. And I was explaining to her um, how demoralizing it is for some of our teachers to sit here and look at 10 or 12 blank squares. And I'm sitting here looking at 10 or 12 blank squares. And that's okay because you all have that as your option. But Renee was telling me one of the reasons, Ted, that you're losing your steam and it's hard to continue is you don't get the feedback from the audience that we're used to getting. So as I sit here and I look at 12 blank screens, I think it's a good time to just stop the meeting <laughs> because I think we've accomplished our purpose. I don't even know if people are listening or watching. I don't really feel that need to move on um, because I'll be honest with you folks, it's been happening at a lot of these events where we get together. Uh, the only reason I decided to do this is because I live in isolation. Um, I do not have people living at my house most of the time. And I started to do this to connect to you. And all I find is no connection. So I'll just open it up to you guys and let you stop there. Um, I'll be getting in touch with some of you as to see how Rittenhouse proceeds forward. Um, but there has to be some reason that we all do this from this side of our screen. And to sit here and look at 12 blanks <laughs> is not really what cuts it for us. So I don't know if, Renee, if you wanted to chime in, because she tried to make me see today that one of the things we're missing is the feedback from the audience, which we well, have thrived we got on. the feedback today. We got a lot of questions. And, um, you know, most of the time, you know, when the speaker's talking on speaker view, everybody does turn their video off. That's just commonplace. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, this is a very informative talk. And I enjoyed it a lot. I don't. I'm not as knowledgeable as some of you guys to be able to ask some of the questions. But um, I thought this was a good meeting. I did too, and I'm glad some people are turning their cameras back on. Yeah. Um, let's just say maybe it's my insecurity, everybody. But when I turn my camera off, uh, I walk away. I walk away, and I'll do a laundry load. I'll do something in the kitchen. Um, I get the impression when the screens go off as many of our teachers do, and I talk to quite a few teachers that are doing this now, they get the impression that nobody's listening at all. And it's very demoralizing for them. They sit there yeah. all day looking at, you know, 20 blank screens. Mm -hmm. And you did actually ask us all to shut our screens off during the talk to say I, bandwidth. So you, I got it. I you got can't it. have it both ways. And um, if you want to save the bandwidth, you've right. got to accept that you don't know whether we're actually here or not. So it was a very good, like I said, it was a very good ending there, especially with Ken, but I'm churning the questions on the chat room. Um, there's only two people on that chat room asking a question. So it's very difficult to figure out, you know, how am I going to present? If you look at the questions, I'm the one who's posting the questions there, and I'm trying to churn up some type of, uh, I don't know, conversation there so that we know where to take that. Um, but yeah, if you guys could learn how to use that, uh, that actually, cause Ken can see that too while he's talking. We can all see the chat. I just put it on there. just now. Yeah. Just there you put go. it on just now. And oh, but, but let me just ask you this, Ted, it's related to the point that you were just making about the blank screens. 
You yeah. are going to put this online. I just had a friend who couldn't tune in. She yeah. missed it. But you're going to put this online so people can watch it afterwards, right? Well, I'm going to put out a call to the people in our membership for assistance because um, I'm failing at the video management. Oh. I've gotten to the point that we're somewhere around 10 videos in now on these. Um, I don't really have the expertise to ec uh, to edit them the way I'd like to. And they're kind of piling up in the background. Ken, you'll be one of the first ones that if someone, and Joe Stein, or Joe, Joe is trying to tutor me in the background how to do this type of stuff. Um, but when we have some people step forward to help with the process, it'll get there even faster. <laughs> and until we have those people who can step forward and help, you know, it's a promise I'll keep to you, but it's all on me at this point. If you send me the file, uh, Ted, I can do some editing and send it back to you, the edited portion. Okay, we'll do that. And Dan did do it. Thank you. I did, Thank you. I appreciate I, that. I had forgotten. Well, I have beginning. friends who want to see this. Okay. Yeah. Cause, and what we'll do is we'll chop off the commentary at the beginning, at the end, right. we'll just run your talk there. And yes. that's really, the, that's really the goal, Al, what we want to do. Sure. Um, we have, and if, if you really need, if you really can help, we are two or three backed up. And I think on muddy run, I think five need editing. <laughs> just one for muddy run. Just one. Okay. On the website. So I haven't looked back at them recently, but there's there's talk on there. There's like the pre and post. And here's what we were talking about. And just so everybody knows this. So you're all on here now and you've all turned your cameras on. And the one thing that I didn't like was um, I, if I were you, I wouldn't necessarily want my picture being filmed and put on a website somewhere. Yeah. So what we decided in the last couple of times we've been together is that what we'll do is we'll just post the uh, guest speaker portion. Uh, that'll be it. And what we'll do is we'll encourage people to sign on for membership and then they can get to hear all the other stuff that goes on, you know, the before and the after of what's actually happening. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it was really good right there. Does anybody have any other questions for Ken? Yeah, I have one more. I got to run, but I wanted to get this in. Uh, Dr. Kramer, I have a family home in Daytona Beach. So if I'm mm -hmm. ever down there and I give you a call, can you let me in as your additional photographer to some of the places? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I get a lot of people asking me that. Uh, unfortunately not. However, what I can do is show you around where you can watch from. But NASA is really restricted, especially under COVID, it's super restricted. Uh, the press site, like I said, is not even open. Um, to be media, you have to have a bona fide media outlet. And so for me, even sometimes it's difficult. But if you come down here, contact me, and I'll be glad to, sh to, to show you the places exactly where you can see and nice places to eat and good hotels. Daytona Beach is about an hour and a half north of here. It's not that far. At yeah. night, if you're in date, if you can't make it down here and it's at night, you can actually watch <laughs> along, go to the beach and you can watch the, the rockets fly by, especially if they're going up the East Coast, like to the space station uh, or this Starlink that just launched the other night, basically hugs the East Coast. And so you can see it at night. If it's clear, if it's clear, you can see it. And uh, so yeah, yeah contact that, me if you come down. Yeah, I did that as a kid, but uh, and, and, and the other thing is, Jean, Jean, here, come on here a minute. She, she, she again. She, she works at the visitor complex, get, get, there we go. and she works in Space Shuttle Atlantis, what she used to work on. Mm -hmm. All right, and if you come in the visitor complex, she'll give you a personal tour. I will. Okay, any of you come. There's so much you know, man There's on so them. much to see, and that part is open. You can't go to the Apollo Saturn Center, yeah. but you can see the space shuttle, the real space shuttle Atlantis, mm -hmm. okay, that I showed you guys pictures of in, in, at other talks. I didn't show you tonight, but the real one that flew in space that I was inside and that she was inside <laughs> and worked on, she can give you a tour all around it anytime. Are you all invited just, okay? Because you're all friends. And I, I wanted to add, there's so much hand sewing on the space shuttles that people have no clue. There's tons <laughs> of hand sewing on her. Yeah. Wow. And so like I said, she can give a talk. She can give a full talk also. She's been a guest speaker at NEEF. She was the, Ted, you talked about NEEF. Yeah, I yeah, organized yeah. the speakers. She right. was a speaker there uh, at the last one that we had, actually. I invited her to give a talk and it was like the best received talk. 
of the whole, and I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> not right. exa you can go look and see, uh, and see that was the 2019, right? Yeah, because I had actually a lot of big lineup. I had Thomas Serbuchen, the head mm -hmm. of NASA science. He was going to come this year, 2020. Didn't until they did, COVID hit. Didn't they do it virtually? They did it they virtually, did it virtually and he did give a virtual talk, and it was okay. excellent. And okay. uh, he said he'll come back. You know, he'll try to come back next year. I don't think we're going to have it next year because the vaccine is still going to, it's going to take a while to roll it out to enough people. And that conference is in April. And, um, and it, I don't think it's, but, you know, if they delay it to September, it might work out. But, uh, but anyway, um, she can give a talk. I can give a talk when we come up, we come up there next summer. And uh, we're happy to, uh, show you guys around. Jared, you're there too, right? Yep, Jared, I'm right, here. right there. You saw your picture. Yeah. He'll help out. Al, I was He'll pushing get Mud media credentials, so he will help. I was okay. pushing Muddy I was pushing he Muddy Run to I was pushing Muddy Run to Ken and yes. I told him uh, you would be here tonight and that uh, I'm sure that he, we'd like to have him come out and be a guest speaker with us at one of the open houses next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'll be great as soon as we open up again. Yes, we, we're definitely coming up next summer again. We were right. going to come up this summer, but everything's canceled. So, right. but we're coming next summer. And we well, even if you're up, see even you if you're up next summer, we have a limit of ten. So the two of you could come into the observatory with us. We usually have two or three other people who are oh, okay. in there setting it up and and basically you know then we zoom it live but it's kind of neat to be right on the site and do it you know rather than sitting in your basement right right, right. Well, why would it be limited to 10 i'm just curious um exelon has a policy right now it's a visitor center that they have and uh -huh. that's their company policy they don't want more than 10 people in the center at a time uh, oh the, okay i thought it was a big observatory okay i, I it guess it is I had it's a wrong impression it's actually a big visitor center with an observatory sitting next to it. Yeah. <laughs> the visitor center was there originally, right. and that's run by Exelon. And there's actually people who work there, you know, every day. Yeah. So they have a building policy of ten people, and they don't have big meetings. And everybody's checked uh -huh. in, temperatures are taken. Right, right. They're trying to they're trying to do it right. They're trying. Yes. If someone yeah. were to get yeah. COVID, they they'd be able to do some you know screening right. or yeah. Well, we can do the tracing. same thing what we did tonight. I just like <clears> to see it. So, but no, um, yeah, that's why I say we we we'll get you out there live, and you just zoom right. with us live, and we bring everybody in this way. So yeah, we'll look forward to that next summer. Could be a cool one. All right, and you guys, like I said, if you're if you're you can support us by buying pictures or buying apparel. All right, masks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ken. These are it. the best masks you're gonna get. Believe me. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Any other Thank questions? You. Any Thank other you. questions? Um, to reply to L. Ryan's question about the ethics of pregnancy, we start by experimenting... No, I just see that now. Yeah. I don't in, know an answer to that one. We start by experimenting with pregnancy in mammals of lesser ethical value. If you're too squeamish about using rats or mice for the purpose, we will use tax inspectors. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tax inspectors, yeah. That's funny. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's a good point. It will have to be, I mean, it'll have to be explored, absolutely, because if we're going to have a colony, like uh, uh, Al Ryan was asking me about, if you're going to have a colony, you got to have babies, and if you're going to have babies, then uh, you got to have them developed safely. But, you know, that's why we're doing the, the work in space. How does, how does, how does space uh, impact the human body? Plus, <clears throat> on Mars... There's radiation on top of it, not just low gravity. At least it's a third gravity, but the, but there's a lot of radiation. So you'd have to be underground, okay? Once you're underground, you're you're okay. But and there's ways to mitigate the radiation. Like water is good. Water is a good uh, radiation uh, absorber. Um, yeah. So the work will have to be done. How it's going to be done, I don't know. That's that's a great question. So what we're going to do is uh, to end our meeting tonight, we're not going to turn off the uh, portal. Um, this is like the official time, I guess. We're, we're past nine o'clock. So if you'd like to say goodbye to everybody, you can. Um, what we also decided to do, though, is if anyone wants to just hang and talk with someone who's here, you're more than welcome to. If you haven't figured out how to use the chat room, that's that's the good way to you know drum up any conversation with anybody on the board. 
I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight and uh, <laughs> gathering together here with us. And uh, it's good to see your faces. Thank you for turning on some of those cameras. It just makes, yes. Yes, so all you gotta remember is the day before Thanksgiving, a lot oh, of people I know. are busy. I get it, but I was just saying, I was just, I was suffering that thing that three teachers have said to me, Imagine sitting in front of a screen all day with three or four yeah. heads and 20 black squares. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it just got to me while I'm sitting there. And I understand the whole idea that we're turning off during it, but yeah. you know, maybe we should make a, a point to turn them on afterward <laughs> because yeah. this is the only time I see any faces like this. <laughs> so people were still there. I saw the black screens and I was wondering, like, I wondered if Jared had ditched me or not. Yeah, I know. That's I know. It's it's just weird. That's that's what we just, think on our just end. turned off the screen. I didn't we're, need we're to know. Get, this is the first in. time I'm yeah. doing a Zoom. The first time I'm doing a Zoom. So right. I don't even know how it works until today. <laughs> Zoom has been 